well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Comedy. My name is Cam Edwards. I'm glad you're with us today. The uh, Florida legislative session getting underway and uh, permitless carry, maybe constitutional carry. We'll see if the bill gets amended to include uh, open carry. Uh, is expected to be one of the uh, first bills up for consideration in the House. They have already uh, pre-gamed through committee. Uh, this uh, House legislation, the uh, Senate, I believe, is holding a uh, hearing this week on their version of permitless carry. We've got to get you covered uh, at Bearing Arms throughout the week on all of these developments, not only in Florida, by the way, but in Nebraska, where the uh, debate over permitless carry, actually true constitutional carry, because open carry is allowed in Nebraska, uh, that has already passed. Uh, first reading, uh, Democrats are trying to filibuster this. They are trying to delay not just the uh, constitutional carry bill in Nebraska, but basically every piece of legislation that Republicans are putting forward. So it could be some time uh, before the constitutional carry legislation in Nebraska clears the unicameral legislature. But I think we're still uh, on track to see that happen. I, 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 the Democrats might be able to delay this, but I don't think that they're going to be able to block this uh, measure completely. Uh, so we're looking at the potential for permitless or constitutional care to be approved in Florida, Nebraska, possibly South Carolina as well. State House has uh, cleared uh, their constitutional carry bill. It is awaiting action on the Senate. And we did just have constitutional carry introduced in Louisiana as well. I think the odds are probably a little longer there. Uh, the last time constitutional carry passed out of the Louisiana legislature, Governor John Bell Edwards vetoed that bill. And then during the veto override session, there were a couple of defectors, both Democrats and Republicans, by the way, who had previously supported that measure, who, for whatever reason, uh, changed their mind. Yeah, a couple of them no longer in the legislature. A couple of them have very uh, cushy political appointments since that vote was taken. Purely a coincidence, I'm I'm sure. <clears throat> anyway, uh, we're not going to be talking specifically about constitutional carry today, but we are going to be talking a little bit about what's going on in Florida. Because not long ago, uh, Diana Muller of the D.C. Project reached out to me and said, you've got to see this testimony. Uh, and she sent me a little clip of a 14-year-old, May Topino, uh, testifying before a committee in Florida um, about a number of, I think this was about the Senate bill, which includes some school safety measures. And I got to tell you, I was really impressed uh, by what May had to say. Not only the poise demonstrated, but the real common sense coming out of May's mouth. So I'm very pleased that uh, last night I had the opportunity to sit down with May Topino and uh, ask her about why she decided to start speaking out and speaking up, uh, as well as why she believes it is so important to protect and defend the right to keep and bear arms. Take a look and a listen to my conversation with May Topino. Mate, thank you so much for coming on Cam and Comedy. It's so great to talk with you. I really appreciate your time. Oh, absolutely. I'm so excited. You know, I've never done a podcast before, but I feel like, you know, some things just need to be said. <laughs> well, this has been, I guess, a, a time of firsts for you, right? Because I, I think this was your first time testifying before a legislative committee this year as well. It was. So um, we actually, we went to Tallahassee, me and my dad and Diana Muller, and we went up there and I watched them testify. And before we left, um, she asked me, she was like, so would, would you ever testify? And I was like, no, no, I'm not going to do that. And we went up there and I saw them do it. And I was like, OK, OK, I see. But then I saw these kids get up there. And this girl went up there and she started talking about how she was so scared and all the guns need to go away and all this stuff. And I was just it made me mad because, you know, you don't you shouldn't have to be scared. And th their legitimate concerns that she was bringing up that a lot of kids deal with. And so I just wish that that they could be educated and, and know that it's not the guns, it's the people. And it's, you know, a whole nother problem that has nothing really to do with gun control. So I guess I was just I kind of it was made very clear to me that I need to step up to the plate and say something because no one else is going to. Well, that's true. Um, and, you know, I think that that your voice has a lot of power, quite frankly. Um, you know, the media does love to focus on these young voices and these students who are advocating more gun control. But 
You know, one of the things that you told lawmakers, I, I thought was really important. You said, just like those students who are advocating for gun control, you want to feel safe in school too. But more than that, you want to be safe, right? You don't yeah. want just these sort of soundbite solutions that that are designed to make you feel better, but don't actually do a whole lot to improve student safety. Absolutely. And I always, it, it became very clear to me as I was sitting in school, going through all these lockdowns and, and stuff going on, it became very clear to me that our, our idea of safety was incredibly fragile. At any moment, they can just go on the intercom and say, this is happening. We need to go on a minor lockdown, anything. So that kind of like not security really bothered me. And it, it made me very aware that our idea of safety is, you know, whether or not we feel safe. And well, you know, we can, we can kind of control that. But what we should be controlling is whether or not we are actually safe. So what we're hearing is translates to what we feel off of that, right? But I want to make sure that there's no reason for us to feel that way. So if there's no reason, then we don't, we don't have to worry no matter what, you know, no, no school shootings should be happening. This is all to a certain degree preventative. But not through banning guns. No. So I, mean, I don't think that. Well, let me, so let me ask you, why, why not, May? When you hear people say, listen, the common sense, reasonable solution is to ban these battlefield weapons of war. If we just ban the AR-15s and every other so-called assault weapon and maybe throw in semi-automatic, uh, all semi-automatic firearms too. But, 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 but we could solve this problem if we just had the right amount of gun control laws on the books, why, why doesn't that resonate with you? So, you know, I've been around guns a lot, so I, I understand how they work and all that stuff. So that's, that's just like one thing, but there's a couple reasons why gun control won't stop school shootings, in my opinion, at least. And the first one is that if someone wants to hurt themselves or hurt somebody else, they're going to find a way to do it. People say, oh, all these gun violence kills this many people. Well, you know, a large amount of that is from suicides and they, oh, stop that, right? So this is just an example. Well, if someone is dead set on killing themselves, whether they're not, they have a gun, you know, if they're going to do it, they're going to do it with something else. So if someone is going to commit an act of violence, if someone is going to want to take somebody else's life or their own, whether or not they have a gun, they're going to find another way to do that. And we've seen that through drugs and schools and knives and all of this stuff. So there are more ways than one to do something bad. And people are going to find that out. You know, listen, that's a really good point. Um, and, you know, frankly, the type of violence that you talk about, the, the you know, the random fights in the hall or maybe somebody pulls a knife. I mean, obviously, those incidents are much more common. Right. Then those rare circumstances where an individual decides I'm going to try to take out as many of my fellow students as I can. Thankfully, um, those are pretty rare incidents. But, you know, one of the debates that we're having right now, and it has really uh, not as much to do with the Second Amendment, but, you know, there's even a debate over whether school resource officers are appropriate, whether it's a bad thing to have, you know, uh, police officers in school, because that might lead to more students getting arrested and more uh, students going to prison. Um, That's ridiculous. I was going to say, I mean, it, do you find a lot of this debate over student safety to be kind of out there in la la land and not really relatable to, to reality, uh, the, the reality the students are living? Absolutely. I think we need to look less towards fear and, you know, just. We need we need to look for the solution, the actual solution, how things are really going to play out in real life and start by we it's not an easy fix, you know. You talk about gun control and, and saying that if we just take away all the guns, instantly everyone's gonna be safe is kind of a lazy way of thinking about a solution for um for violence because it just shows that, you know, you're you're not thinking about everything else. You're only thinking about the guns and the violence, right? So then by that logic, they're entirely connected and there's nothing else involved. But, you know, um, I, I do think a lot of this extra stuff, um, this, you know, talk about gun control and all this stuff, 
it's not it's not really the solution. You know, we have we have a mental health problem. We have drug problem. We have families, you know, falling apart left and right. And not to open a can of worms, but all of those things need to be improved as a culture and as a society for these problems to start happening less and less and hopefully eventually go away. But to just point at the weapon they use and say, that's a problem, we need to get rid of that, makes no sense. So so let me ask you, there have been a couple of polls that have come out recently showing um, declining support for a ban on, on so-called assault weapons. Um, and the last one, I think, was by an outfit called Quinnipiac. And actually, the age group that was the least supportive of a gun ban were they didn't they didn't poll people under the age of 18, um, but 18 to 24 year olds were the least likely to say, yes, let's let, let's go ahead and ban these guns. I think that would make a difference. You know, the gun control lobby has spent a lot of time and energy and money um, investing in developing the next generation of gun control activists. When you talk to granted, and I understand, you know, your peer group may be more comfortable with firearms. So maybe that, you know, uh, biases the, uh, uh, the the people that you're talking to. But does it surprise you that this poll found, I think it was 47 percent of 18 to 24 year olds said, uh, oh, yeah, let, let's ban guns. Um, d- d- does that surprise you that that number is that low? Uh, and is the media or are people like me missing out on what conversations are actually taking place among people your age when it comes to gun control. So to clarify, you're asking if, so so the poll you reference says that more young people are against the ban on assault weapons. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. That, that does surprise me. You know, I, from what I've seen going to the state Capitol and all that, there were far more kids that, that I saw and that I met that would have, gone against that so i'm actually surprised by that but i think that's great you know well i I obviously i do too uh and and i'm a little surprised by that too but i wonder if you know i I don't know it may be that there are a lot of people in that age group who aren't gonna go and testify against a bill but they don't think it's gonna do much either right um and and but you get the sense that among your age group there's there's far more motivation um, to to be pro gun control than to stand up for the Second Amendment. Have you gotten pushback when you've spoken out since you've spoken out? I haven't gotten pushback, but um, I have I have gotten a surprising amount of support. Really, um, someone even called my parents um, and said something about me doing a good job on the news, and it kind of freaked me out, but. <laughs> um yeah i don't know <laughs> yeah i can i can understand why that'd be why that, why that would freak out a little bit but you know listen clearly what you said had an impact um and i think I that is fantastic so do you think you'll as as freaked out as it was to have a stranger contact your parents and say hey wow made it a great job um do you think you'll keep speaking out do you think you'll keep uh, uh, you know, being a more vocal advocate for the Second Amendment. I initially couldn't see myself doing that, but um, with a little a little push from Diana Muller, my unofficial aunt, as I would call her. <laughs> She's um, really good the, about uh, about giving those pushes, by the way, isn't she? Yeah, I know Just <laughs> the DC project, but with a, with a good push from her, it kind of launched me into this thing that's just spiraled and, and and I wasn't planning on it but I could see myself um testifying again and and doing a little bit of ad- advocacy but I don't really want to get on social media or anything like that um I'm just a kid so I don't want to be out there too much but my my perspective is important and I realized that the first time I went to Tallahassee and I was like whoa you know there's nobody else speaking out there's no one in my situation at least speaking out and that kind of freaked me out. So I was like, whoa, the, the world needs this, whether it's from me or not. But somebody needs to do this. Absolutely. And again, you did a fantastic job speaking out. Um, as somebody who is not really on social media, I, I firmly support your decision to stay off. Uh, it is a cesspool. It is garbage. And uh, you're much better off without it. But having said that, I'm glad that you are going to use your voice appropriately whenever you can 
Uh, and may I hope that that involves coming back on Cam and Company. I'd love to have you back on the show at some point. Absolutely. Sounds awesome. Well, listen, thank you again for spending some time with me. And uh, thank you for what you've done in the past and what you're going to be doing in the future. I really appreciate you using your voice and I look forward to continuing this conversation again. Awesome. Again, I appreciate uh, May joining me on the program. Uh, and I'm looking forward to having her back, maybe getting her dad, Philip, uh, involved as well. Uh, in the uh, next interview, but uh, again, uh, I'm I'm really, really, I'm I'm glad that May was able to join us. But I got to tell you, I'm even more appreciative of the fact that May is using her voice uh, in such a valuable way. Because as I said, you know, the polling indicates that gun control is actually least popular among uh, younger Americans. That you'd never get that idea uh, based on the media. So we do need voices like May out there. And, uh, I'm glad to see her using her voice. All right, let's turn our attention to today's armed citizen story, our good deed of the day and our recidivist report. We'll start there with a, a case out of Pennsylvania where Democrats like Philadelphia mayor, Jim Kenney have been complaining that, Oh my gosh, it's easier to buy liquor than it is to buy a gun or no other way around easier to buy a gun than it is to buy liquor in Pennsylvania, which by the way is not true. But, uh, you know, as a mayor of Philly, what are you going to do? Um, while Democrats are intent in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania uh, statewide on going after law-abiding gun owners, criminals are getting away with a slap on the wrist, including firearm traffickers. Yeah, like this guy, uh, Norristown man Tyrese Dilworth Simon. Sentenced after admitting to gun trafficking activities, he pleaded guilty to corrupt organization-related charges and received a whopping sentence of a few months in the county jail as a result. Yes, yeah, sentenced in Montgomery County Court to uh, 11 and a half to 23 months in the county jail after he pleaded guilty to charges of corrupt organization, sales to an eligible transferee, conspiracy, and firearms not to be carried without a license in connection with a gun trafficking scheme. That took place between March of 2019 and May of 2020. Dilworth Simon, by the way, will also receive credit for the time he spent in jail while awaiting trial on these charges. So odds are that uh, Mr. Dilworth Simon is going to be let loose very, very soon for participating in this gun trafficking ring. Uh, the judge in this case uh, ordered Dilworth Simon to complete five years probation following parole, uh, meaning that he'll be under court supervision for about seven years, which honestly... <laughs> means little to nothing, right? Because as we've seen, you can violate your probation, you can violate your parole, and oftentimes that results in a slap on the wrist at best. Um, as the uh, Montgomery reporter uh, reports, Dilworth Simon was among six men charged in May of 2020 in connection with this uh, gun trafficking organization, which was uncovered as uh, county and Norristown detectives investigated firearms violations in April of that year using uh, various investigative techniques, including reviewing social media posts. Some of those social posts, uh, social media posts, depicted some of the defendants brandishing firearms to uh, basically let others know, hey, we've got these guns available for sale. Um, detectives wrote in a criminal complaint, the investigation culminated with numerous search and seizure warrants where police uncovered a criminal organization responsible for the illegal purchase and transfer of multiple handguns in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. So, Basically, they were engaging in straw purchases. Um, 23-year-old uh, Edzon Castrojohn uh, and his brother, uh, Mark Richard Castrojohn, also known as Snacks. Yeah. Uh, they were sentenced to four to eight years in state prison after they pleaded guilty to charges of corruption organizations related offenses. 21-year-old uh, Joshua Aguido Jr., uh, was sentenced in December to three to seven years in prison after pleading guilty to weapons-related charges. Now, Guido is also serving a life term for first-degree murder in connection with a uh, 2021 shootout, so he's not getting out of prison anytime soon. Uh, Mark Fatir Odell Jones, also 21 years of age, previously pleaded guilty to charges of firearms not to be carried without a license uh, as part of a plea agreement. He was sentenced to 11 and a half to 23 months in the county jail, followed by three years of probation. Uh, 26-year-old Jonathan Hernandez, previously pleaded guilty to charges of corrupt organization. He is awaiting his sentencing. Uh, and then again, um, in this particular case, um, Dilworth Simon, yeah, 11 and a half to 23 months in county jail. Again, credit for time served, so not long behind bars before he's once again out. Now, if these cases had been referred to 
the federal judiciary. Uh, it is possible, it's not a guarantee, but it's possible that these uh, defendants would have received uh, five or more years in federal prison. Uh, it sounds like, at best, one of these defendants has the possibility of spending at least five years behind bars for gun trafficking, right? And again, th these laws are already on the books. <laughs> we don't need to pass new legislation. This is already a crime. Uh, and these are the individuals, not legal gun owners, but it's guys like Dora Simon and his compatriots who are helping to illegally arm violent criminals in places like Montgomery County and Philadelphia. And yet when they're caught, what happens? Again, plea bargains get dangled in front of them. They take the plea deal. They get a slap on the wrist and they're sent on their way. When we talk about enforcing the laws that are already on the books, this is what we're talking about. And it's not happening. Not in Montgomery County, not in most jurisdictions around the country. Now, today's Armed Citizen story from McCarroll County, Virginia, uh, which is a couple hours southwest of uh, where I live in the Farmville area. Beautiful part of the state, by the way. It's kind of where the uh, Piedmont meets the uh, the Blue Ridge Appalachian Mountains. Galax, Virginia is not far away. It's uh, Hillsville, Virginia. Some great chili dogs. They've got this huge swap meet every year. And apparently, uh, they occasionally have problems with naked women trying to uh, break into homes there. Yeah. Uh, the sheriff in Carroll County says a naked woman was shot after attacking a homeowner with a frying pan. Thankfully, both the uh, homeowner and the uh, suspect in this case are going to be okay. But this was kind of a weird and scary situation. It happened on uh, February 26th in the uh, small town of Austinville. Investigators say the uh, homeowner heard a noise coming from the back of his home. And when he checked it out, there's this strange woman. He'd never seen her before. Butt ass naked uh, coming through his door. And then she began hitting the homeowner with a cast iron frying pan. Those things are heavy. Never actually been hit with one, but I can imagine it would hurt. Homeowner was able to get the woman out of the house, lock the door. And I guess, yeah, at that point he thought, okay, well, that was strange. Maybe he had uh, picked up the phone to call police at that point, but the woman went back to the home, this time around to the back porch, and began turning off the electrical breakers on the outside of the house, banging on the kitchen window while yelling at the homeowner to get out of her house and threatening to kill him. Uh, moments later, the homeowner grabbed his gun and uh, shot the woman in the lower leg area. Authorities identified the suspect as 35-year-old uh, Paula Michelle Locklear. She uh, is now out of the hospital. She has been charged with felony breaking and entering, assault and battery, as well as damaging property. Authorities say the uh, homeowner will not be charged as he was acting in self-defense. So I'm not sure what led to that encounter, but uh, I hope that uh, Ms. Locklear gets the uh, help that she needs, uh, either in custody or uh, maybe in treatment somewhere. Um, finally, our good deed of the day, in the right place, at the right time, we'll able to do the right thing. With a hovercraft, that's right, in uh, Alabama, a, a good Samaritan helping law enforcement rescue a couple of canoers with the help of his badass hovercraft. Hovercrafts make everything better, don't they? Uh, this from uh, Bibb County, Alabama. On Saturday morning, two people uh, were on their canoe out in the Cahaba River when they tipped over. Uh, and the river was running pretty high at the moment. So this was not a, a you know peaceful bucolic bubbling stream at that point. Uh, Misha Creel, who is a volunteer firefighter with the uh, West Blockton Fire and Rescue, says with all the rain and the storms we've had recently, the river will flood. It'll rise and it was up a little higher than it was supposed to be and moving a lot swifter. They got in a current over the rock shelf and it caused the canoe to flip over. There were a number of law enforcement agencies in the area that responded, including the West Blockton Fire and Rescue Department. Um, but so too did a guy named Rick LaCroix. He is a uh, former game warden. He is a current hovercraft owner. And as Mr. Creel says, he's a great guy to have around in Bibb County. Um, he said the water, she said the water was too rough on the boat that was out there. So they called him in and he was actually able to get to where those uh, canoers were. McCoy said, uh, even when the river's down like this, it can get you if you're not careful. It really doesn't care what your social status is. If you mess up, it may get you. Now, Corey says uh, he works with area law enforcement whenever he can. He says it uh, feels it's his duty to come whenever he's called. He says, I think the Lord has given me a skill, and he expects me to use it. 
Well, the Lord may have blessed uh, Rick LaCroix with the skill, but uh, he's the one that got the hovercraft. And again, in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing to uh, save those two canoers. Rick LaCroix, we thank you. And all of the uh, emergency crews out there in Bibb County for your very, very good deeds. All right, that is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you, as always, for being a part of today's program, and I'm looking forward to being back with you tomorrow as well. Make sure you check out BearingArms.com throughout the day. We've got you covered on all of the Second Amendment news and information from all across the nation. And I would also encourage you to become a VIP member. Not only will you get exclusive content, news stories, analysis, you won't find anywhere else, but you'll get that warm, fuzzy feeling of knowing that you're supporting the independent pro-Second Amendment journalism that we do at Bearing Arms. And if you become a VIP Gold member, not only will you get access to that exclusive content at Bearing Arms, but across the Town Hall Media family of websites. And you can take part in our VIP Gold live chat with Hot Airs Ed Morrissey and myself, as well as other great live chats. Uh, Ed and I's uh, live chat coming up on Wednesday. If you become a VIP Gold member today, you can take part tomorrow, 1.30 Eastern. Hopefully we'll uh, see you there. In the meantime, have a great rest of your Tuesday. We'll see you back here tomorrow with another edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. Until then, be well. Be safe and be free.